Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, a weekly broadcast dedicated to helping you make your number by getting your peers to share with you how they are making theirs. Today we're going to demonstrate how to get sales improvement programs adopted in a matrixed organization. So why this topic? Large enterprises are investing heavily in sales enablement, yet many are not realizing the full value of these investments. And one of the causes of this unfortunate outcome is the matrix organization. The matrix is required in these large enterprises to simply deal with their massive scale, but this creates an added level of difficulty for sales enablement leaders. My name is Greg Alexander. I'm the CEO of SBI, and I am your host today. And helping me with our demonstration today is an executive who knows a thing or two about this topic. His name is Ian Peterson. Ian runs sales enablement inside a matrix and has at places like Sun, Oracle, and now Frontier Communications, three very large enterprises. So, Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate being here. And Ian, if you wouldn't mind, please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Um, as you say, my name is uh, Ian Peterson. I'm an expat from the UK. Uh, I came over to the US uh, 17, 18 years ago um, on what was meant to be a short-term assignment. I uh, finally enjoyed it, kept the family here, and um, as you point out, had opportunities at some microsystems, uh, Oracle, and uh, recently moved over to Frontier. Been here just over 75 days. And I'm um, delighted with the opportunity that's in front of me. And Frontier Communications, would you explain to the audience what Frontier does? Yeah, sure. So uh, Frontier Communications is uh, in the telecommunications business. It's a voice uh, data uh, cloud uh, high-tech uh, company. Uh, we service the U.S. market predominantly in 29 states. Um, you can think of us as a traditional telco, but we uh, also extend into uh, other areas, uh, uh, consumer products um, uh, for, for customers, as well as um, Internet services and, um, and cloud services. Okay, very good. All right, so let's jump into the questions. So as I understand it, Ian, you report to the EVP of operations inside of an $11 billion company. Most sales operations and sales enablement leaders report to a head of sales. So please describe the nature of the matrix you operate in. So if you think about Frontier, the company, and the way we're structured, there are really three pieces to where revenue comes from. Uh, one is the carrier wholesale business. The other is the commercial business and obviously the residential business that most people who touch Frontier probably know us for. Uh, my boss, John Lass, who's the EVP of field operations, uh, is in charge of seven regions that in and of themselves contain those heads of sales for commercial sales. And it's the commercial sales aspect of this that I'm particularly uh, uh, interested in and, and driving results for and making sure commercial revenue growth is realized. Okay, very good. And, and these regional presidents don't report to you. Um, you don't have any authority over them. So how do you get them to adopt your programs? So um, I think it's fair to say that everybody uh, inside Frontier uh, is looking for Frontier to be successful. So at, at some level, this is never about making people do something they may not want to do. Um, but really finding out uh, what it is that are the priorities and the initiatives and the programs that people have passion around and driving uh, to make themselves successful, be it a particular region, be it a particular segment of that region, commercial or wholesale or what have you. Um, and then making sure that what it is that you have by way of, uh, you know, powder to their keg, that you can turn around and help drive greater success for them. And I think people intuitively recognize that, you know, good, good salespeople differentiate themselves um, from average salespeople 
uh, by the level to which they invest in their own skills and understanding of the marketing and understanding of the product. And if you're running a training or an enablement program around new product or new products that's available in their market, then most people are going to want to avail themselves of that just by the nature of the beast. Um, and so if you can provide a, an alignment between the things you're providing and the things that people want, they, they will take them. They, they, they don't have to be made to take them. They, they, they will sort of fly off a shelf. Um, and that is obviously where we try to make sure that we can paint a value behind everything that we do, be it why we would use a CRM system, why we would be um, changing the way a process works, why particular training or enablement techniques are going to make them incrementally successful. Make them want to adopt it um, by showing them alignment to the things that they care about and they're driving for their own outcomes. You know, it's a great example, and it's one of the reasons why I was excited to hear that you're going to be on the show today, because sometimes I deal with sales enablement leaders in particular who work in a matrix inside of a mega company like you have, and they feel that they can't be successful because they don't have direct authority over resources. And uh, it's not true. You know, if there is value, um, you can get people to adopt your programs. And the way that you do that is, um, you know, you get things done through others. And that's, exactly. a, that's a skill, right, that, uh, that we all have to develop. Okay, last question for you in this segment, then we'll take a quick break. So why did your company decide to pull sales enablement out of the business units and centralize it under your leadership? So I think that's very much to do with your question about scale. I mean, Frontier um, doubled in size uh, from what was a, a much smaller company uh, through M&A and then doubled again uh, through increased recent M&A this, this, this calendar year. And you do get to a point at some stage where you have to start realizing you can't always do what you always did in a different environment. And there are things just as intuitively obvious that you don't want to do, and that is have seven different CRM systems, have seven different training functions, uh, onboard new resources seven different ways over. Um, it cripples any ability to do analytics. Um, it makes it very hard to understand where Things like A-B testing are really successful because there is so much difference um, that you can't really conclude anything. Um, and Frontier needs to grow. Um, and understanding where growth comes from, what things uh, can be tried and be successful and then can be replicated, requires for there to be some level of consistency behind this. Um, if everybody takes different approaches to territory definition, to CRM deployment, uh, sales enablement training and understanding of the product portfolio, uh, then by default, they're going to be lots of small companies. And I think um, Frontier recognized that. Um, some of the uh, programs working with SBI um, uh, and, and, the, and the leadership team here made them realize that there was a point at which big means doing some things differently, and some of that centralization resulted in, in my hiring and putting together this centralized function. Um, and it's for me to prove that that was the right decision from here going forward. <laughs> yes, it is, and I'm sure you will. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. So let me ask you a question. Are you operating in a matrix and need a better way to get your sales teams to adopt your programs? If so, I think SBI might be of assistance. Consider having one of our experts spend some time with you in a workshop. And to get a feel for what's covered in this workshop, go to sbi.tips forward slash 2017 workbook and download a copy of the workbook we use in those workshops. And if you're watching the video show, I have in my hand that workbook that I just mentioned to you. As you can see, it's a beast. It's about 400 pages, believe it or not, organized into steps and phases and exercises, etc. And uh, if you find yourself running sales enablement inside of one of these mega companies, working inside of a matrix, uh, there's much wisdom in that workbook and much wisdom in the workshop. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Okay, this is the SBI podcast. We'll be back in a bit. Meet Tom. He's the CEO of a leading medical device company, and this is his business partner, the latest SBI workbook. Every day, Tom uses the workbook to guide his sales and marketing vision. The yellow sticky? That's his corporate strategy. The pink sticky? His product roadmap. The dog-eared section? That's where Tom's mapped out next year's growth plan. The stain on the cover? That's from the champagne he popped open when they made their Q4 number. That was a good day, wasn't it, Mr. Workbook? How do you SBI? Take it to the next level with the SBI Workbook. 
Order your copy today at HowDoYouSBI.com. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the SBI Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Alexander, and today's guest is Ian Peterson, Senior Vice President of Sales Ops and Sales Enablement at Frontier Communications. Today, we're demonstrating how to get sales improvement programs adopted, adopted in a matrix organization. Got a little tongue-tied there, excuse me. So let's jump back into the questions. So, uh, Ian, how do you work effectively with senior executives inside a matrix who may not fully understand sales? You know, that's a great question. Um, and <laughs> uh, one of the things I think is that at some level, everybody understands sales on a, on a personal level. And it's about really building that understanding that they intuitively have as an individual um, by relaying some of those things back into how business-to-business -business sales mm -hmm. operates. One of the things... Um, I've heard in my time at Frontier is, um, you know, how enterprises operate, uh, how commercial entities operate on a business-to-business -business basis is, is different and it's complex. But deep down, um, it's, it starts with a realization that everybody is a decision maker first as an individual. Um, and yes, there are pressures on doing things within an enterprise um, and you need different approaches to things like marketing, you know. Uh, Somebody actually only today gave me a great example. You know, enterprise customers don't care whether or not they get a gift card as a result of doing something. Um, they care about their bottom line. They're driven by different things. And it really is sometimes just a matter of educating people about simple examples that they can easily relate to and challenging them to think differently about business-to-business -business and enterprise scale uh, transactions. But your question about not understanding sales, um, I think is an interesting one because to not understand sales um, is, is perhaps not to understand the mechanics behind it, uh, things like a territory management and establishing quota and understanding the product portfolio. Um, earlier on in my career, I remember working for a boss who said, it's very simple, Ian. You've just got to know who is selling what to whom. And when you break it back down at some of those simple levels, then you can start really getting behind people who may not understand and feel it's a threatening environment into some simple things. Who are we selling to? Who is a decision maker? What are the personas that we really need to go and understand and what their motives are as an individual? Somebody tasked as a CFO, different motive to somebody who's operating as a CMO or a head of HR. Um, and then obviously understanding what it is that we're bringing, not just as a product, but in terms of a value um, as a service, how to help with whatever it is that their objective might be, lowering cost, increasing value, improving, improving their customers' experiences, uh, and so on. Um, and then being able to put it together in a way that has a high degree of uh, valued experience on a customer lifecycle basis. So it's not just about the sale. It's about extending the sale into the installation and delivery, the use, the maintenance, the service, and ending up with a net promoter score that will help with recommendations, but then drive the reputation of Frontier within the community, but its services within the customer base, that its services, and then within prospects that, you know, hear and understand good things, customers that will expand their share of wallet with us. And putting it into simple terms really does help our executives get through that web. Their focus may be elsewhere, but understanding what it is that drives the income, what, where the revenue and top line results come from in a sales perspective, and how that ties back to the component pieces of the operation they care about um, really does help them get their head around sometimes why it's important that we're going after certain things, why we require some of the infrastructure we, we require or the focus or the prioritization of efforts and initiatives. Okay, so very good. I think start simple. Yep. You know, so the reason why I, I asked that question and the next two questions I'm going to ask is because when you're inside of a large corporation that has business units, these business units are led up or head up by general managers. And these general managers may have come up through finance or operations or product or legal or what have you. And they're general managers, they're mini CEOs, and they may not have had their career um, begin and advance through the sales function. So if you're a sales enablement leader working in that environment, 
part of your job is to continue the education of that senior executive as to what it means to be best in class in the area of B2B sales. So that's why I'm asking this set of questions. So let me, let me go to the next question, which is similar to the one that I just asked, which is, how do you work effectively with senior executives inside of a matrix who are focused on quarterly financial objectives on strategic sales improvement programs that take longer than a quarter to implement and see results? So that's a, <laughs> that is, of course, a perpetual challenge. And the horizons, um, be it monthly or quarterly or annual, are, are, are always, uh, you know, uh, have the potential of being conflict with one another. I think that the key things are making sure that when you have um, sales improvement initiatives or projects or programs, things that we need to go after, make changes to, or, or set as a, a particular priority, that you have small wins and that you can see milestone events that you can look to uh, to be able to get, uh, you know, an early platform that shows signs of success, you know, early buds kind of thing. Um, and I'll give you sort of a real example. Uh, sometimes within a business, revenue uh, may take a little while to realize on the top line and uh, margins, positive margins that flow uh, from that uh, can be months out from when you've done work to that. But the booking growth that you see that drives that um, eventual conversion into revenue um, can be tracked and monitored much sooner. Um, you can look at things where you determine what positive behaviors might look like and positive activities might look like even ahead of that um, to understand pipeline growth um, that you need in order to meet future booking objectives, for example, based on conversion and adequacy of a pipeline um, come about as a result of sales activity, and you can look to that development of pipeline as a result of activities, and you can tweak where you're investing resources and the task management uh, of those resources very, very short term to drive to that outcome. And as long as you can draw that line from this investment to these resources with this oversight, and, and, and I call it a management as opposed to, just, you know, more tactical than the leadership of the management of those resources to get that result, then you can start turning around and drawing a line as to why that's going to generate you the sales pipeline, why that pipeline over the course of time will convert, where you'll see both bookings and where both bookings in turn become revenue. And obviously different things within that, you know, different products and services have different time horizons, but it's boiling it back and not promising, hey, in this period of time, six months from now, we'll have this terrific thing, you just got to do it. But you do have to recognize that oftentimes if you delay, you will just delay the benefit that comes from it. And most of our general managers, I think, understand that. Their job is to balance those with enough uh, cost investment up front with the expectation of the results and tying a line to those incremental steps along that journey helps them prove a knothole very often of uh, being concerned about, um, uh, you know, overly concerned about an objective here and now and, and not, you know, being sufficiently focused on the future. Yep. But it's tying the two together, Greg. Yep. So asking a general manager of a business unit inside of a big matrix to be patient is a mistake. So Several of things that Ian just mentioned, so milestone advances, small wins, bookings growth, pipeline growth, connecting those to investments. Those are the ways that you increase kind of organizational patience for your sales improvement programs. Okay, moving along here, one last question in this segment, then we'll take a quick break. So Ian, how do you work with, how do you work effectively with these senior executives, again, inside of this matrix, who own the P&L when you need them to fund your programs? So <laughs> I, I'm going to have to draw on some past here because obviously at Frontier, 75 days in, you know, yeah. we're still doing asking. Um, and um, it would be unfair to turn around and, and sort of cite huge gains in that regard. But most of the time, I think what you're asking for is, again, it goes back to how to benefit those general managers, um, those senior executives um, on the things it is that they care about. Um, and very oftentimes, a straight investment in something, just dropping some money on something is a cost. An investment has to show an ability to get a return from it. Um, and so when I want somebody to, to help support something but, but requires funding, it has to be in the context of a business case. But there, there is no appetite for a trust me 
um, give, give me X and good things will happen without being able to show um, something of a more robust business case to that. And you also, I think, have to appreciate as well the context of, of, of your partner in this, but a senior executive who does own a P&L but is the source for funding for something, understanding their pressures and being able to turn around and partner with them, I think, is incredibly important. And that comes from building you know, credibility, building a relationship with them um, so that you can actually partner to get a lot of these things done. Yep. Um, and I think that partnership is, is, is you know, is, is often underplayed. I, I worked for a boss once who said, you know, your objective in, in operations and enablement, as in many uh, functions with inside large enterprises, is is to have people work for you even they, they, they don't work for you. And a lot of that comes from relationship, from, from trust and partnership. And that's how I think you get things funded, by establishing that uh, collaboration and that partnership and then being able to move those initiatives through, smaller, bigger, um, but by working through how to meet their objectives and your objectives collaboratively. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Okay, we're going to take another break. Before you come back, head over to Apple's App Store and download the SBI app. This will allow you to get all of SBI sales and marketing content like this show in a mobile friendly way. Okay, we got one more segment with Ian after the break. We'll be back in a sec. Meet Jake, the VP of sales for a growing tech company and an avid runner. During his marathon training, he listens to SBI podcasts dedicated to helping you make your number. This way, he can stay in shape and stay on top of the emerging best practices in sales and marketing. Your job as a sales ops team is to make the sales team more efficient. Now that he's mastered the eight minute mile, he's planning to make his number and take over the top sales spot in the tech world. So watch out competition, Jake is right behind you. Help the audience understand how you prioritize those accounts. And he just got his second win. How do you SBI? Podcast, video podcast, blog, TV, magazine. Access it all on the new SBI app, available now in iTunes. Okay, welcome back, everybody. This is segment number three, our last segment with Ian, demonstrating how to get sales improvement programs adopt adopted inside of a large matrix organization. Let's jump back into the question. So, Ian... How do you navigate the politics inherent inside of a matrix from the seat of the sales enablement leader? So I, uh, I have a fundamental belief that people are inherently good um, and that they are working to a positive agenda and a positive outcome, even if it's different from, from yours, uh, if it's different from other people within a, the matrix of your organization. And most of the times, um, it's really understanding what it is uh, that somebody else has as an objective and how you can further that agenda on a broader view. And, and, and by that, I don't just mean, hey, I've got to get this deliverable out by next week. You know, come lend me a hand. Although I have actually done that in the past where, you know, it really is apparent that somebody just needs an extra pair of hands and sometimes you know, that can be valuable to them. But I think one of the most important things is, is seeing as broad a picture of, uh, uh, as possible and not being just overly focused on the sales component piece of this. Um, and there are a lot of components even in that to the enablement functions, overlay sales teams, uh, sales engineering teams, uh, sales support teams. Um, and being able to understand if somebody within this, you know, large matrix has cost constraint or has headcount pressure, whatever it is that that, that is, uh, you know, the driver of the politics behind things. Um, empathy and understanding their perspective is, is critically important. And I come back to some of that, you know, relationship building is key. But, you know, for me, I start from a belief that, you know, we're all driving to the same end game here. So agnostic of the politics of how we get there or, you know, why we don't want to do something, um, I think looking to the positive is always the best way to go and trying to make sure that you are supportive and empathetic and understanding where other people's pressure points are, what their objectives are, and then partnering and collaborating 
to get things done together. Um, I think you know, no, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished is is the popular wisdom uh, kind of thing. But I don't subscribe to that. I, I think that if you have a great partnership, you build um, an understanding of uh, you know where an organization is from a maturity perspective, uh, what different stakeholders' objectives look like, and are empathetic to those. Um, partnerships of a way to go in every sense. Okay. So we're talking about how to get sales improvement programs adopted inside of a mat uh, matrix organization. We've had kind of a, a, a wide conversation. Let me now uh, continue that. Let's discuss headcount. So, uh, Ian, how, how do you get done what you need to get done inside of this large matrix when the BUGMs, they control all the headcount? Yes, they do. And I think um, one of the things which is critical in, in, in terms of, of understanding that is, you know, they, they have objectives they have to meet with those headcounts as well. And so, you know, starting by understanding how to make their heads uh, more productive, how to make their heads more effective and more efficient is, is critical within that. You know, this is, this is not about, um, you know, uh, you know I, I have something that I think is, is good I want everybody to adopt it. I want everybody to participate in it or, you know, undergo training on it, whatever that the programmatic element might be around this, um, and therefore needing some point of control to make that happen. Um, but d demonstrating value and making sure that people understand that if we're going to achieve this collaboratively in partnership, you know, but there has to be an investment in that. Now, I, I wouldn't suggest that you can, you know, run sales operations and enablement with zero heads. Uh, there have to be, you know, some, some, some heads to enable you to have a capacity to deliver still. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have a sales methodology that um, is necessary to be aligned to in order to get a, an increased e efficiency out of a sales team, but is reporting into a different part of the organization, um, showing how and why what we have isn't working or is sub-optimized, how something different can benefit the owner of those headcounts, adopting to, uh, 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 sorry, um, appealing to their uh, need to meet their own objectives then then becomes critical and if you can if you can operate in a sense where it isn't about the control of the heads but but is important it's about understanding how to make those heads efficient and effective agnostic of, of who is leading them it's reflected glory on that leadership but they were the people that turned around and recognized um, how to meet their objectives how to develop their people um, how to have a high-performing team that they are the leader of by making available the services to them. The greatest racing car drivers in the world get nowhere if there's no fuel in the tank. Mm -hmm. So just being able to demonstrate this is higher-quality fuel, this is going to enable you to go faster, go further, means that they begin to understand the value of the fuel that you can bring to their engine. You don't have to be the driver of a car to just simply be the one that you know, makes it all come together. And I think playing a role, understanding within a matrix where you can add to the sum of the parts that incremental value and other leaders can see that and take that on board and drive to their results. That's how together you achieve success. Okay, great. Well, listen, we are out of time. So, Ian, that was a great demonstration on how to get sales improvement programs adopted inside of a large matrix organization. So uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Very welcome. Thanks, Greg. Okay, and I want to thank the SBI audience for tuning in. Last quarter, this show hit another milestone. 63% of our podcast listeners hold the title of VP or higher and work inside of enterprise scale companies. So clearly this show is resonating with that target audience. So we, we appreciate you tuning in and this tells us that senior executives are paying attention. And this is, allows us to secure senior executive guests like we had today with, with Ian. So thank you for your continued support. If you want to learn more about this topic or the other areas we focus on, go to salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash register and create an account. This allows you to personalize your experience with our content. For instance, you can choose the topics you're interested in and how often you want to learn about them. All right, that's it for today. As always, until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number.
This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.